Welcome to the Center Collaborative, Creative Solutions in Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice, brought to you by the Oregon Center on Behavioral Health and Justice Integration, which is also known as the Center. We at the Center are all about solutions. Our job in Oregon is to facilitate improvement of the system so behavioral health and criminal justice can work better together to engage people in treatment while promoting public safety. I am your host, Chris Thomas. I hold a master's degree in clinical psychology and have focused on the intersection between behavioral health and criminal justice for 20 years. Over seven of those years were behind the walls of a maximum security prison. During this podcast, you will have the opportunity to sit in on real, in-depth conversations with experts about complex topics in a way that is both fascinating and digestible. We will focus not just on what is wrong with the system, but what is going right and how we can work together to evolve. Today's episode is part two of a two-part series with Judge Suzanne Shanti, Senior Judge, and Judge Nan Waller, Circuit Court Judge. They are co-chairs of the Chief Justice's Behavioral Health Advisory Committee, the BHAC. Judge Shanti and Judge Waller are speaking with us today based upon their own experiences and are not speaking on behalf of OJD. In part two... We spend time talking about not only the stigma of having a behavioral health condition, but the added stigma of being involved in the criminal justice system while having a behavioral health condition, and how that impacts the lack of resources within the community. We talk about the importance of the role of a compassionate community in changing of the system, and how we need to build in flexibility to meet people where they are with the acknowledgement of barriers that they face in engaging with treatment. We also talk about the importance of engaging participants in their vision of a meaningful life and building hope as a way to support behavioral change. We discuss the momentum for change within Oregon and OJD's BHAC work in this regard. I learned so much during my conversation with Judge Waller and Judge Shanti. I think you will too. Welcome to our conversation. This all speaks to the justice system as part of a broader continuum. The judicial system is part of the justice system, but the justice system also includes what happens before cases come to the judicial system in the criminal context before the cases are charged. But it's all a continuum, and part of the way things have been done in the past is each part of that system have been existing independent of the other, and they haven't been talking to each other. The mental health court is an example of trying to change that because mental health court involves a collaboration with various community partners with the goal of helping the people that are in the court and those, at least for my court, and are people that have severe and persistent mental illness, have been convicted of a crime, and may or may not have a substance use disorder. Usually they do. The vast majority of our folks also have a drug or alcohol problem. But that is the judicial system reaching out to the community partners and trying to build services for this particular population, which is the population that Judge Waller just talked about, that no one wants to serve, or maybe they have a desire, but they don't have the resources. But they're certainly not the first people that are in the door when a new housing unit opens, or when there becomes more prescribers available, for instance, in the community, which I know community-wide, there's a shortage of prescribers of psychiatric medications. But our population in the mental health court, they don't have the access even to what's out there. It's a very narrow road for them to find somebody to prescribe their medications. So I think that in the mental health court, that's part of what we're doing is trying to connect to the community partners and trying to build that support. But there's stuff that happens before that, which I know your program has talked about the intercept model before Chris. So I won't go into that. But before that, before the person is in the criminal justice system, if we could have a more consistent delivery of services to those folks, they would be in a better place and 
everyone else would be in a better place as well. I think the mental health court is one model to help alleviate this. But as Judge Waller just explained, she's got a lot of people in mental health court. And the other day, she told me about someone that was wanted to sleep on her bench. Is that right, Judge Waller, at the in court? Because he didn't have anywhere to go? We let him sleep in the conference room right off of our courtroom. He was exhausted. We found him granola bars. We got on the phone and tried to find somebody who could provide the help that he needed, which is not the traditional making a decision on the case in front of you role of a judge, but it is absolutely the role of any of our specialty court judges where you're dealing sometimes with people in crisis who need something immediately. And I don't think any of us would be human if we could just say, that's just not my job. This particular person, because of COVID, everything is locked down. But he knew the courthouse was open. He didn't have a hearing. He just came in and I thought, my goodness, I'm glad that we were open so that we could try to get him to where he needed to be so that he could get some help. He explained to me that he was in every kind of crisis. I wish I could say that the happy ending of the story is we were able to come up with a great plan and he has long-term supports that he needs. He had short-term help and then was back out on the street. I find that story so incredible. I think it really speaks to the relationship that he had made with you and with the court staff and seeing the court as a safe place to get help. And yet it is such a sad statement to the extent of the system and where we are right now all at the same time. It's beautiful and heartbreaking all at the same time. I, I think, Chris, that the whole issue of stigma right now, throughout our all of our communities, we have a rising level of homelessness. And I think that there are many people with significant behavioral health issues who are also homeless. And I absolutely understand why people in the community are frustrated. But I think that, that frustration has almost led to just get people out of sight, out of mind. We're tired of it, which has pushed more people into the criminal justice system, which is ill-equipped. And we do a good job in mental health court and all, but we should not be the first line of assistance for people with significant behavioral health issues. Hopefully people can get the help that they, they should be able to get the help that they need in the community, a caring and compassionate community that will make sure that the services are there and available and the supports are there, that people won't feel as they're walking down the street in a crisis, talking to themselves. They won't be greeted by people with their smartphones up laughing and, and taking pictures of them. That's not the compassionate community that I think we believe ourselves to be. But I see sometimes that that is, in fact, what we have become. And I think that's very difficult. People understand they may be in the middle of a moment of crisis, but they still understand when people are laughing at them. Judge Shanti, I thought I heard you taking a breath. Did you want to add anything to that? Well, no, I was just taking a breath because in some ways, the situation that we're in is both so heartbreaking and outrageous that it's hard to see a path forward. The problem is immense. Judge Waller was talking about stigma and the stigma, for instance, of people that are drug dependent. So in drug court, you can help somebody, and you don't even have to be in drug court, but if you can establish some what we call clean time, then there's some housing. There's not a lot, but there's some housing that you could get in recovery houses, for instance. And in drug court, we get grants to provide money to help people get into the recovery houses to at least stabilize their living situation. But the problem with that is before you get clean. So the stigma is that you are a drug addict. That's not the clinical term, but that's the community term. Oh, that there's a drug addict. The person is using drugs because that's part of their disorder. That's why they have a substance use disorder, which means they're using drugs. I'll just use heroin as an example or methamphetamine. So they are using on a daily basis. They are unhoused. They can't get housing. They can't go to the mission 
because you have to be clean to do this. They can't get temporary emergency housing because you have to be clean. We don't have what in Canada they call wet houses. And I, I think they have some in, down in California. And part of the reason that we don't have those is the stigma of using. So there's this disconnect between the disease itself and trying to get treatment for the disease, but then throwing roadblocks up and giving people what they need to get the treatment. And it's the same thing with people that have severe mental illness. They, as Judge Waller said, they are particularly difficult to find housing for, even low-income housing that would take other kinds of folks. They're not too keen on having someone that might be a difficult tenant. And even though there's laws that you're not supposed to be able to discriminate against someone based on a disability, it's pretty easy to bypass those laws and come up with all kinds of other reasons that that you're not going to be able to serve this person. It's like a repetitive cycle. So the person's unhoused and frequently unmedicated or untreated if it's drug or alcohol use. In the drug and alcohol use, you say, okay, you can go to treatment. But that shows a lack of appreciation of how difficult it is to get someone that is actively using in an unstable environment where they're forced by their circumstances to be around a whole bunch of other people that are using to then just say, oh, I'm just going to go to treatment. It's just, it's a a fantasy to think that people are going to easily be able to do that without support. Similarly, when people have severe mental illness and they're out on the street and you want them to be in the mental health court, you can say, this therapist will see you if you show up at nine o'clock in the morning, and then we'll get you a prescriber if you show up at 10 o'clock in the morning. And the person is unhoused, experiencing their mental illness, and they're living in a chaotic situation. And so then they show up not at 10, but maybe at 11. And instead of there being something in the system that is flexible enough to deal with that, the answer is you missed your appointment. So the system throws up a bunch of roadblocks, even the system that's there to try to help people. And I don't really know how to build in that kind of flexibility, but we've got to figure out a way to meet people where they are. We've got to figure out a way to say to someone that is a daily heroin user, we have housing for you here. We're going to stabilize you in this housing. We're not at this point going to expect that you're not going to use because we know that you can't not use right now, but we are going to help stabilize your living situation. So then we can give you the pieces that will help you arrest your disease or to the people that are experiencing their mental illness, the same thing. Some communities have crisis centers. Can we have a crisis prescriber that goes out and connects with the person? Can we have people that bring the person their medication instead of saying to the person that's living behind the Walmart in a tent city with a bunch of other drug users and a bunch of other people that are experiencing uh, mental distress, instead of saying to that person, you got to be there at 11 and here's what they're going to do. And then you're going to take your prescription and you're going to go fill it at wherever. Can we get people to do that service on site. That's the kind of, in my mind, the kind of transformation we need if we are going to start really turning the tide on this enormous amount of human suffering. And the human suffering, as Judge Waller just pointed out, is now starting to bleed into, quote, the normal community, right? The general population of people that are downtown or people that are business people or just the general population that don't have those problems. It used to be that the people that had the problems we're talking about were somewhere else. But the increase in the number of people is meaning that more of the community is having contact with those folks and the responses to that contact, the responses are not helpful and they're generally cause more problems exacerbating the situation. So we do have to invent a different way of addressing this to to my mind, but I'm no expert on it. I'm just, it's more like my experience of what I see. And so I, I don't know exactly how to get to the place where we can turn this tide. OJD has been working with the GAIN Center to plan for regional behavioral health centers. And in the Portland area, 
one of the things that keeps me going on the bench is also then working on solutions. And I think that all judges or many judges have that. Things may not be good, but if we can work on them off the bench, then it makes sometimes the horrible decisions that we are left with or the predicaments where we can't solve somebody's problem more manageable in the moment, knowing that there will be the possibility of future change and improvement. But we've been working on a behavioral health emergency coordination network with the idea being that whether somebody needs a sobering center or whether they're in the middle of a mental health crisis, that having a safe place to go to get people stabilized, to get them on medication, then gives us a lot more options in terms of next steps for them. And right now we have people who show up at EDs all the time or they are seen by law enforcement because somebody calls, they're in the middle of the street in a crisis, and law enforcement takes them to jail. And that starts up the whole criminal justice system, which may absolutely not be the best plan for low-level behavior that is more nuisance than highly criminal. And so looking at trying to find a way that we can get people stabilized in the moment without law enforcement having to make a decision, is this a mental health issue? Is it a substance abuse psychosis that I'm seeing at the moment, and instead do a warm handoff and then getting them stabilized so that when we do then reach out to community partners, we'll be able to get them the support that they need. What you're just talking about, Judge Waller, is in the microcosm of the mental health court, I know that everybody that's in mental health court does not succeed in the mental health court. The program can't help everybody that it's trying to help for a variety of reasons. But if anybody went to a mental health court graduation or just sat in for a couple months, maybe six months or a year, maybe even longer, and you watched the growth that the folks that come in, you watched how hard they work. You, you could take someone just as an example that starts out unhoused, seriously mentally ill and with a substance use disorder. And you can watch that person bit by bit with the patience of the judge and the encouragement of the judge. And importantly, with the encouragement of the community support people, whether it'd be the mental health treatment people, the drug treatment people, the recovery specialist that helps people figure out housing and education or how to apply for social security disability, all the ancillary pieces that you need to be able to create whatever meaningful and satisfying life, whatever that means to the individual. The court would never dictate what that is, but that it's a meaningful and satisfying life. They get treatment and help in how to manage their psychiatric disability, how to manage their drug dependency, and they get all that help. And you watch them, a lot of times they start out not able and not wanting to trust or to reach out. The system has been their enemy. And they've been burned by it multiple times. They're not trusting of people that say they'll help. But Over time, you see them little by little starting to reach out for the help. Then the people that are on what we call the team reach their hands back and give the helping hand. And it's just a bit by bit process where the person starts reclaiming their lives, recreating who they are. When you get done and the person is ready to leave the program housed with an idea of what they want out of their lives, like interests. If they can't work, if their disability doesn't allow them to work, they have some other productive thing that they're doing that brings meaning to them. You just see people become who they want to be in a way that they didn't have the opportunity to do before. And if you see that, it just tells you that if we invest in the things that we need to invest in, not everybody, but a good portion of the people can reclaim their lives. And it's what that does is it has a ripple effect out to their loved ones, people that are stable on their medication and people that have stable living situations, people that have had difficulty with what we call criminal thinking, because that's the way that they've been enculturated by the environments they've been in. And those thought processes have been worked on and they've let those things go. 
They become positive, productive members of our community. And they're lovely people that when you start out looking at them, you, you might think this person is a danger. And I don't know how this person could live that way. And then you watch them transform and they transform because they have the support. That's why they transform because they have people caring and providing them with the services that they need. And they're doing all the work. It's not like you can snap your fingers and the services create a new person. They have to do the work, but I've, you see it. You see them do the work. So if I wish everyone could see that. And then maybe we would have a chance to get the resources and build a system that would provide people with that kind of support without them having to be in mental health court, without them having to have committed a crime, and then just really get the luck of the draw that they're in mental health court instead of in jail. I want to make it clear that we see absolute miracles sometimes, which I think is what really keeps us all going. I keep on my bench three welded boxes that were made by a mental health participant that I call my boxes of hope. They're really, I think, works of art. A woman who'd come into mental health court had lost her housing, her relationship, her children, very serious charges, and a serious mental health disorder and a substance abuse issue. Over the course of her time, she got her life in order, repaired relationships, went back to school and was welding. I wanted to know more about what she was learning. So I asked her for a picture and instead she made the boxes, which I said I would keep on the bench and they are a starting point in many conversations when I have people in front of me and I say, well, what would you like to do? Which I think for many people, it's a foreign question. Nobody's asked them what they want to do. They have told them what they need to do, what the requirements are, the directives. And we have all of those. But giving people hope that there is another life opportunity for them than just being directed by judges and doctors and probation officers and lawyers, I think is very hopeful. And I've had amazing conversations around the boxes of hope with people who say, I thought maybe I would like to at some point, but I know I really can't. And then we start the conversation. Everybody needs incentives in their lives and giving people who haven't felt worthy of an incentive. We got one person into housing and he said, I'm not worthy of this. And I said, oh, of course you're worthy of nice housing that is clean and a roof over your head. So changing that internal dynamic for people, I think, is part of what we need to do, that we need to have hope, and then we need to give people hope that they really can make the changes, that we have confidence in their ability to do so. I think you both bring up excellent points. In treatment courts, we hear over and over again that for participants in the treatment court, this may be the very first time in their lives where they've had that kind of support in order to engage in treatment. But also to have somebody, particularly someone they see as an authority figure, be hopeful about their future, give them praise and positive feedback, ask them what they would want to do versus just telling them what they should do and how they should be and what the rules are and what a game changer that is for someone to start thinking of their life differently and really increase that motivation to engage in treatment and look at engaging life in a different way. This may be the first time that has happened in this person's life, and they could be 20, 40, 50 years old at this point. I think that's right. One of my mantras to folks is that you deserve to live a meaningful and satisfying life. For a lot of people, that's a foreign concept. Like, why would I deserve that? And what is that in the second place? It's important to me with all the description of the misery. And clearly we observe just unfathomable grief and hopelessness in our work. But at the same time, I think probably Judge Waller would say as well is that I've been witness to valiant healing and just the inexplicable resiliency of the human spirit. People can and do overcome obstacles that are unbelievable and horrific, and they can and they do overcome those. And what's also a beautiful part about this whole process of working with people to rebuild their lives is that you also get to witness amazing acts of kindness and self-sacrifice coming from people that don't have much. I've seen people in our courts reach out to each other and give the little bit of what they have 
to somebody else to help that other person have what they need or to help boost that person forward in our program. So there's a lot of darkness and ugliness, and there's a lot of hopelessness and sorrow, but there's also a lot of just beauty and kindness and amazing transformations that it's just a microcosm of the whole human condition. And it tells me what we can do. The proof is there in those folks, those people that are living satisfying and meaningful lives after they had the opportunity to, and the support to address the circumstances and conditions that brought them into the court in the first place. Judge Waller, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? There are days I despair being in mental health court because we can't give people what they want, but there is never a day when I don't recognize what a privilege it is to work with people who are really wanting to do better. All specialty courts operate on a team model, and I will say I'm so incredibly fortunate to have a team that everyone is trying for the same thing, to get people to the point where they have a life, which of course they are absolutely deserving of a life, just as we all are. And I think that helping them, which in the end is of course to the advantage of all of us, when people are productive, when they're doing well, that's to the benefit of the community. And so I I think that helping the community understand that embracing people and figuring out ways that we can support them is going to, in the end, be better for all of us. There's a site in Italy that's a World Health Organization site that I wanted to visit it last summer, but COVID interrupted, where they've closed most of their psychiatric hospitals because they're really looking at the four pillars of what people need. And they're what we all need. But I think with people with mental illness, these are things that sometimes have really, they don't have. Housing, social connection, relationships, and purpose. So when people are coming into mental health court, sometimes I think as I'm telling them about what's going to be expected and all. And then I'm asking them, what would they like to do? What are they good at? What what are they interested in? People are taken aback because those aren't the questions often that they're getting when they're being placed on a probation. But we know that we need to not only have people doing well on probation, fulfilling the requirements of their probation, but we also need to have people build the foundation for a life. And that requires connections, relationships, and a purpose. And so whether it's volunteering, or whether it's going to school or finding a job, or some people we start with small steps of simply getting out every day and walking around the neighborhood. Those are all things that are going to give them some purpose. I think that COVID has been very hard because the structure and support of being able to come into court in person is gone and we contact everybody, but it's not the same. People are begging to come back into court. And so we're hoping, uh, fingers crossed, that we'll be able to get there. We've started having some people come in occasionally when they really need to see the team, and we're hoping that we can get back there again. It really has been a stark reminder to me when people are, are begging to come to court that we're filling a need beyond simply supervision, support, and treatment. I love these stories of hope because we really need them in this work. Uh, it's so easy to be crushed by the weight of how difficult the system being used loosely is to manage and the difficulties that we have in it, which makes me think of, I see you both a lot in different committees over the years. I'm glad to see that Oregon has really started to move more and more into how can we all work together to improve the system so we have a system. And we're starting to get, we need to meet people where they are and making changes to that. I'm curious if you two want to talk about the BHAC and some of those initiatives that you're working on or the other initiatives that we're all working on about some of the changes we're working towards in Oregon. One of the things that I love about BHAC is the goal of, and we have lots of different projects and initiatives that we're working on, but I think that overall we recognize that we need a system of care, not just services, and that people need quick and easy access, the no wrong door, and that we need services available in the community before people get to the point of needing court intervention. But certainly when they do need court intervention, that The door that they walk through doesn't determine the services that they are going to get and what's available. We have multiple committees 
by subject matter committees in BHAC that are working on a variety of issues. We have a committee that's working on aid and assist. We have specialty court committees that are dealing with each of the kinds of specialty courts that we have in Oregon. We have a performance measure committee. We can believe that we're doing well, but we also want to be able to show that we're doing well and set performance measures so that we can hold ourselves accountable and that the community is aware of what we are doing and can hold us accountable. I mentioned that we're working with the GAIN Center on developing behavioral health resource centers, and there's certainly a lot going on in Salem around developing a crisis system right now. So we're excited to be able to see how that plays out and to be part of that conversation. We know that it's helpful for judges to get together with other judges in order to really build the kind of system of support that we need throughout Oregon for the people who are coming into the specialty courts or people who are in a family law case who are having behavioral health needs. We want to be able to have the courts be responsive to anyone who's coming in with behavioral health needs, no matter what the case type or door that they walk through. We're also in the process of collecting data information with respect to aid and assist and civil commitments. What we're hoping to find out from that data is where are the gaps? What can it tell us about the different tracks that people come into. People go to the state hospital on an aid and assist, and they are provided with care to restore them to competency so that they understand the court proceedings. That's a different kind of care than the care they're going to get if they come in through the civil commitment process. And the data may show there's crossover between some folks. It may give us some information about how many times the same person goes up on an aid and assist, which would inform the judiciary and anyone else that's interested, like the legislature, about where the dollars should be put in trying to resolve these issues. My understanding is it's $1,500 a day for someone to be up at the state hospital on an aid and assist. If we could quantify how much that is and how many people are doing that and then look at what the cost would be to provide some different services to either prevent those people from penetrating the criminal justice system at all, like the crisis centers that the GAINS project is working on and some of the Oregon legislation that's being proposed. If that money were provided to support those kinds of resources, it might be that we can reduce the number of people going into the hospital on aid and assist, and then that might free up hospital beds that are necessary for civil commitments for people that really could use the intense treatment but aren't getting it right now because we don't have the resources at the hospital. One of the things that is so exciting about the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee is that we are reaching out to other people in the state, like Oregon Health Authority and other stakeholders. There's conversations with CCOs, counties, all the people that are involved in trying to figure out how to fix the situation that Oregon is in. And I've been very optimistic about the incredible commitment by people just across the board that have been working on this for a long time. And for a variety of reasons, it seems like now we have more opportunity to address these issues, more interest, more passion, more momentum than we've had, I I don't know, for as long as I've been a lawyer. Do you feel the same way, Judge Waller, about the, the potential and the opportunity and everyone coming together to address this as a common problem? I do. I think we're at a moment of crisis that we need to fully take advantage of. And my hope is that this will not just be, I think we're great in Oregon sometimes at planning. And then what we really need is the implementation. And so my hope is that we will be great at implementing, not just planning, because we know that Oregon, in terms of some behavioral health issues, our outcomes are not what any of us would want them to be. And so I'm hoping that At this moment of time of bringing people together and people working together, and I think that's happening, I would absolutely agree with Judge Shante that we have the legislature is really interested. We have both at the local level and state level partners who are 
really trying to come up with change. We have the opportunity of 988 coming online next July to really help build out our crisis service system. I'd much rather be optimistic, which I am, than pessimistic. I think that would be a hard position to be in in dealing with the kinds of cases that we both see. And I am optimistic. I think we have good reason for optimism right now. I'm particularly optimistic because I don't think there's been this level of different stakeholders coming together to both plan and then implement. In years past, it was more siloed, the planning, and then you tell somebody how they're going to be part right. of the plan, which doesn't work really well, right? <laughs> because not many people buy into that. So what I've been loving in the different work groups that we've been in is the diversity of stakeholders in those work groups having really difficult conversations and thereby finding a path through versus it being a stonewalling siloed position like it's been before. So I know that in some of the statutory groups we've been in, those kinds of difficult conversations have really made it possible to do significant changes where if those conversations hadn't happened, I don't think those changes would have been possible. And those changes were definitely for the better. I absolutely agree with that assessment. We're bringing together in the arena that we operate in two large major systems that don't even speak the same language often. They clearly have sometimes different perspectives on how things are done, the behavioral health system, the criminal justice system. And so to see people so willingly wanting to come together learn from the perspective of the other system and be able then to plan to meet the needs of both while including community voice and perspective is so gratifying. And I think that's one thing that I'm really gratified about. I think we have a better chance of success because everyone recognizes that we need to engage from the get-go people with lived experience, people who represent the diversity of our communities so that we're sure that we're getting it right. That is absolutely part of procedural justice also, that we're not just doing to others, but we're saying, let us come along beside and try to plan for something that's going to work for you and for the community. Judge Waller, I was just thinking about that. Like this, this whole conversation has circled back to the principles of procedural justice. The Efforts that the BHAC is making are at the behest of the Chief Justice of the Oregon Supreme Court. And the fact that the judiciary is trying to reach out and help and participate and give voice to our experience and what our observations are, and then work with the people that are at the other ends of this continuum to better provide services to the people that come into the court. There is an aspect of procedural justice in that, in that we are understanding who these folks are and how they could be better served with all of the community coming together. And it's not just the court in a silo saying, okay, we're just going to handle this piece, which is the decision-making piece, without pulling our heads up and looking around and seeing the landscape and how that landscape influences what's brought before us and what happens to people. I don't think there's probably a judge that has not had that experience where Someone is being sent to prison, and you can just see that this whole thing could have been avoided if there had been some different decisions made along that continuum of the person's experience. And so that's part of the procedural justice, I think, is that for the judicial system to pick their head up and look at the landscape and see the people as more than what their experience is in just this limited proceeding in front of us. I agree. And I think that part of this moment in time is that we have all three branches having leadership that is committed to improving how we support people with behavioral health issues. My hope is that we continue to work together and that we're going to see the results. And I think that for judges, that will make dealing with difficult cases much better. And for the community, I think that the results will be much, not only appreciated, but they're going to be really what the community wants, which is that we're going to be able to deal with people and support them in their decision-making. And they're going to be 
welcomed into the community. That's my long-term goal for all of this. You're both right. Our conversation has come full circle, but really hasn't. We've been basically talking about procedural justice and procedural fairness the whole time. I'm wondering in our time left, what lasting thoughts you'd like to leave our listeners with? I think this has to be not only our major systems stepping up and coming together, but it has to be in concert with community. There has to be a community will to understand that, of course, we have to provide for people with significant behavioral health issues. That's part of being the kind of community we see ourselves as caring and as committed. And that takes all of us not just judges or legislators or agency heads, but it also takes the community reaching out, making sure that people understand that they are part of the community and we have them, that we'll be there to support them. We may also be there to hold them accountable when that's the necessary tact, but we'll also be there as a community to support them. What I would say is we're all in this together. We are each other's neighbors. And how we treat each other influences the life that we're going to live. And the judicial system or the justice system is not a separate entity. It is the community. It's part of the community. And so we have to work together to solve these problems. It's not someone else's problem. It's not the person with the drug addiction or the person that is experiencing a mental illness's problem. It's not the person charged with the crime's problem. It's all of our problems. And the reasons for the situation, the reason that someone is in the criminal justice system, the reason that someone is walking the street, experiencing their mental illness, talking to uh, somebody that none of the rest of us can see, those reasons are not only and because of that person's decision-making. No one stands independent of all the community influences, and it's just this big web. And if we want to have a, a community, if we want to have a life that is satisfying and meaningful to each of us, then we all have to pull together. We're all in the boat. There's no way out of it. We are all in the same boat. And if we don't row together to try to get us where we want to be, we will not get there. And the judicial system, the justice system is just part of that. So I guess that's my take on what I like people to think about is that we all belong to each other. We all belong to each other and we're all in the same boat. What a a beautiful way to end the podcast. Judge Waller, did you have anything you wanted to add? I saw you. I heard you. I think that is a wonderful way to end because all of us, every one of us knows people in our personal lives, in our families who have behavioral health issues. And what we want for each of them is to be cared for and loved. And the people that we see, sometimes those relationships have been frayed but getting them back to that point of being understanding that they have a place at the table as much as anybody else, I think is so imperative for us to have a healthy community. So I, we greatly appreciate Chris, the work that you do. It is been wonderful to be able to work in concert with you on some of these tricky, complex issues. And I, I've thought sometimes about why is it that the problems are so great? And in, in part, I think it's just that that the problems are so complex and tricky and multiple systems and are involved that it's been hard to tackle. But I think we are at the right moment in time, and hopefully we have the will to see it through to implementation of productive and positive change for our communities. Thank you so much, Judge Waller. I really appreciate that. And I'm very appreciative of the work that both of you do. And I'm always happy when I get to see you when you're on committees with me. So I appreciate how much you both bring to the table, the compassion and the heartfelt humanity that you bring in the courtroom. So thank you both so much for joining me on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. You be well. Thank you. 
The Center Collaborative is a production of the Oregon Center on Behavioral Health and Justice Integration, a specialized division of Greater Oregon Behavioral Health Incorporated. It is produced by me, Chris Thomas, with production assistance from Patrick Kennedy. Music by Patrick Mulvihill and Patrick Kennedy. Subscribe to the Center Perspective using your favorite app. To learn more about criminal justice and behavioral health in Oregon, visit the Center's website at ocphji.org. You can also find us on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Please reach out to us. Join us next time as we chat with the experts about programs and partnerships at work within this complex and yet compelling field.